All right, Exodus chapter 7. Um, we're going to pick up there reading about how God has sent Moses and Aaron to go speak to Pharaoh. And in these chapters, we're going to see that Pharaoh's heart, sometimes we're going to read that God hardens his heart, and then sometimes we're going to read that he hardens his heart. And, um, and the Lord is going to use that hard heart of Pharaoh, meaning the unwillingness to let the children of Israel go, to be an opportunity for his great power to be demonstrated with one successive uh, judgment after another. And so his hard heart allows, the dis- I would say, the full display of God's power, but it's not the full display, but, but a, a, a big display of God's power to be manifested. And we are, will read of it, we'll be amazed by it, and that's the intention that God has. Of course, it's to, re- it's to free the people of Israel who have been crying out to him because they've been under the uh, murderous ways of this hard-hearted Pharaoh, and um, the Lord is now set to deliver them. As we go through this, just be thinking about the book of Revelation in the, the last seven years' judgment that's going to come upon this earth. There's so many similarities uh, between what the Lord does here in Egypt and what's going to happen in the last days, although this that we're reading of today in Exodus is rather small in, in comparison to the judgment that's gonna, going to come. So anyway, we begin reading, as God says to Moses, go speak to Pharaoh. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. <clears throat> you shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Verse 5. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded so they did. Pretty important verse, I think, verse 6. And verse 7, Moses was 80 years old, Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. So go and speak. Now we already know that he's been a reluctant uh, mouthpiece um, and has been intimidated. He's often referring to the fact that he's not very articulate. He's not very good at, at speaking. But the Lord says, oh, that doesn't matter. You're going to go anyway. And so He and Aaron will make their way into the presence of Pharaoh. We'll read about these seven plagues here this morning. Um, um, Six plagues, six or seven that we get through. And um, then what we read, though, is they've got some hard things to say. I want you to go speak to Pharaoh. I want you to say everything that I have for you to say. I don't want you to hold it back. And then in verse 6, we read that they actually did that. They, did, they went out and they said everything they did just as they were told. And there is that temptation that all of us, as prophets of the Lord, we all are those that speak forth the word of the Lord and the gospel message. There is that temptation to maybe not share at all. We don't want to talk about it. We'll find out who to share with. Well, we'll share with people that we know are open. Well, <laughs> what about this guy? He's not open. As a matter of fact, I think this is the third time we've read that he will not listen to you. But that does not always um, mean that God doesn't want to speak. I mean, you can think about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and how he spoke to people that did not hear, did not listen. Jesus spoke to many people, and they did not hear, and they did not listen. But a true servant of the Lord will speak everything that the Lord has to say. So we not only call people to salvation and to the hope of eternal life, to have an abundant life, but we also warn them of the wrath that is to come. We, we seek to move them and persuade them from a, a, a place, a position of not believing in Jesus as the Christ and the Lord and the Savior to that place of believing. And we should try to persuade people. And of course, Moses and Aaron, they're going to see, you know, be, you know, able to manifest the power of God that you would think would persuade Pharaoh, and he's not. But we are to be persuaders of the truth of Jesus Christ, not just presenters of an option. Because 
He is the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no other way you can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. So as they're commanded to go and to speak, and you're going to be as God, meaning you're going to have the message that is from me. And you're going to pass this on. So we have been given that privilege to be able to be those mouthpieces, those ambassadors. And we should try to persuade people. Because it's true. Because it's right. Because it's full. Because it's a blessing. And, you know, this idea, well, I don't want to, you know, force it. You're not going to force Jesus. But you can't force Jesus on people. I mean, you, people are going to ultimately, they're going to make their decision to follow him or they won't. So we should come in love and brokenness and present the message urging people to be reconciled with Christ. And if they choose to, to not do that, you know, then that will be on their, their heads. It won't be on ours for holding back the message of life. So very sobering statement to these two guys. Go and speak and say everything that I've told you. And they've got some hard things to say to them. I mean, let my people go. No, judgment's coming. I mean, those are that's about all they have to say. Let my people go. No, okay, then you're going to have to have judgment. Okay, we'll pray for this, this to go away and let people go. Oh, you're going to change your mind? Then there's more judgment. And if we are never wanting to speak of the, the judgment side of, of God, then we will not ever fully communicate the gospel, because the good news only makes sense if you know you're saved from something. I remember I was out witnessing on the streets of Huntington Beach one time. And I went up to this guy, and, um, I, and he had a button on that said, drugs saved my life. And I can assure you, they had not saved his life. <laughs> and he was just a mess. I said, well, <clears throat> I said, I'd like to share with you about Jesus Christ and um, just how he would love to save you. And he says, save me from what? great question. And so we, we have to be willing to present that side of salvation. So they do that. Verses 8 through 13, um, just as was expected, he hardens his heart. Um, in verses 8 through 13, then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks <clears throat> to you, saying, show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod, cast it before, before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And then some will say, well, this wasn't real. Okay, how do you know? I mean, well, because, you know... You know, there can't be this kind of display of power. Satan is able to deceive. And as a matter of fact, when the Antichrist, that last world leader that will deceive the nations, he'll come with all kinds of lying signs and wonders. He's going to do things that are going to impress people. So um, I would lean to the fact that they were able to do something demonic here. And whether these were not actual uh, serpents or not, what we do know is, Moses' rod was, and then his rod ended up, verse 13, uh, 12, swallowing up the other rods, which was a way of God saying, that's great, but I'm going to consume what little power you think you have. I'm just going to consume it. And um, so you have this. Now, 2 Timothy 3.9 tells us the names of two of these magicians. Their names are Janus and Jambres, which is kind of interesting that we have that, know their names. But these are the guys that are acting and working to, um, to deceive. And it, it does. What, when they do, and we're going to see them duplicate some of the other uh, plagues. So um, when the Nile turns to blood, they're also going to turn other water to blood as well, which is like, that's not very helpful. I mean, what we'd like for you to do is to take this pitcher full of, of blood, water, and turn it to clean drinking water. Can you do that? No, but we can make more blood. But even in that, even though it was as useless as that miracle is that they performed, I mean, it was only adding to their judgment, adding to their plight, it does discredit the Lord in the mind and the heart of Pharaoh. 
And that's what is going on here. He's trying to undermine uh, these miracles that are taking place. And, and so, yeah, they can come in. There's an angel of light. There's a, a fabrication of it. But let me say this. I'm not going to hang out on this point. I'm just going to say it and move on. We do not back away from the true working of the Spirit of God and the, the power he can display because people abuse God's power. That's no reason. Because everything we hold dear and precious as believers has been mishandled by somebody at some point in time. Everything. The Word of God, the church gathering, evangelism, you know, uh, you name it. There's been something that's gone wrong with it. And, and this is often a reason people put forward for why they, they say, well, we don't believe that the gifts of the Spirit that were all present in the early church, that they're there. Only some of them are here today. And without fail, they'll quickly go and point to the failures of other churches and say, look at what they've done. Look at how they've abused this. Therefore, it's not real. And, you know, so, I mean, probably one that, you know, is often brought up, and for good reason, because there's a lot of abuse around it, is the gift of tongues. And I, I remember asking somebody, well, what about this gift of tongues? They said, ah, you just make up a word, and you, you kind of get it in your vocabulary, and you just, after you make up a bunch of words, then you can begin to speak in tongues. All right, it was a senior in high school. I said, yeah, that's not right. Yeah, that's, that's dumb. That's just not, I'm not going to make up words. I'm not, that's weird to do that. And, um, uh, but there's a, you can find an abuse for that. But the failure of the church and some believers to walk in the gifts as they have been commanded is not a reason to say, therefore, they're not for today. Has anybody ever abused the Bible? Has anybody ever abused evangelism? Has anybody ever abused tithes and offerings? But I guarantee you, no pastor is going to say we're done with that. Isn't that interesting? That, well, we'll keep that one. We'll just fix it, you know. Well, why don't we fix them all? We've got the Bible in front of us to lead us and guide us to walk into truth. So I'm not going to let somebody else's failure and mishandling it rob me from the legitimate and true that's found in the Word of God. So let's, let's just allow the, the, the Word to guide us. But yeah, there's always a, a fabrication. There's always going to be an abuse somewhere. And so it's meant to uh, lessen the, the Word that comes from Moses and Aaron, if there can be some kind of display of power by his guys, it's like, ah, no big deal. Well, his heart grew hard, we read there in verse 13, and he did not heed them. Now, verses 14 through 25 of chapter 7 leads us into the first plague, and this is where the water of the land is turned into blood. Let's read. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, and when he goes out to the water, and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him, and the rod which was turned to a serpent you shall take in your hand, and you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me or worship me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand and they shall be turned to blood and the fish that are in the river shall die. The river shall stink and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt. Notice this, over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, over their pools of water that they may become blood, and they shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded, so he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his servants, and all um, the river was turned into blood, and the fish that were in the river died. They stank. You can just imagine the smell. And so this is happening now you got your magicians, Janice and Jamborees, and they are able to come along, and they are, as we just mentioned, they are able to turn more water into blood. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it's useless, yet it serves the purpose of discrediting the miracle, or at least minimizing the, the miracle that was just performed. So eventually, they have to start digging wells in verse 24, and we see in verse 25 that this lasted for seven days. Now, why the Nile? 
And we're going to then read about frogs. Why frogs? And why all of these different things? Because each one of these represents one or many of the gods that they worshipped. They worshipped the, the Nile, the god of the Nile. And um, some of these gods were Apis or um, uh, Isis. Um, these were some that you know, were considered to be over the Nile. And so they would worship them. And so if this is being struck, then their god, who is supposed to be taking care of this, is, is unable to. And it shows the weakness and the frailty of their God. And then, again, we'll see this a couple of times. They will perform a miracle that adds more misery. And that is what is true of every religion. It adds misery to people. Because there's only one true living God. His, and, you know, we know him. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the Israelites who sent his son, the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, to this earth and died on the cross for our sins. He's it. There is nobody else. And so, you know, we certainly never want to treat poorly or uh, be mean or, um, you know, be ugly towards somebody that worships another um, God, follows another region, religion. But nor do we want to be silent we need to call people to put their faith and trust because Jesus is there's only one true God. Well, you just got to leave them alone and you just got to let them have what they want. This is what they believe. But if it's a lie, then what kind of person am I to let them believe a lie? Not a good one. Well, but they'll feel good about themselves. Yeah, they'll feel good about themselves all the way to judgment. And so it, well, let's be clear in our thinking if, there are, if you're following another religion, if you're not putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then that religion ultimately is going to do harm to that person. That is why we speak up. Now, I realize that's not politically correct, but that's not why I'm standing up here. I'm not, I'm not standing up here to try and, and you know, push all the buttons that our culture will be happy with. It's the word of the Lord. Say the hard thing, Moses. Give him the whole thing. Don't hold back. And, and so when you see them who worship another, you know, God, the God of Isis or, you know, the God of uh, Apis, and they come and they do these things, it's making the state of the Egyptians worse. This is not neutral when people choose to follow another God and reject Jesus Christ. It's not a neutral endeavor. It's one that's going to do harm to them. If you were to speak to Jesus and look at for a moment in Jesus' life that expresses what I'm talking about, as it would be when he looked out over the multitude and he saw them as sheep not having a shepherd and he had compassion for them. He felt it in his gut. He was struck with the fact that these were people that were being led astray and we should have compassion as well and speak the truth. Not in arrogance, not in haughtiness, not thinking that we're better. We just, we're, we're, we're beggars that have found bread. And we need to tell people where you can find fresh, true bread, the, the bread that gives life. So they have this scene. Now, in each of these plagues, um, there are those that have put forth this idea that all of these ten plagues are simply... A, the result of some natural explanation. So there was a large algae bloom, they would say, that took place um, in the Nile River, which caused um, the river to look red. So you ever heard of red tide? Anybody ever heard of red tide? It's that kind of thing. So when that happened, that causes the fish to die and it begins to stink. And then the next thing is, well, when the, because the river's like this, it causes all the frogs to come out and to come onto the land. And then and they keep on going, and then you have flies, and then you have this, and then you have this. And so they have a natural explanation for all of these things. There's one problem with the natural explanation. God said, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And it isn't just, if you look at the details, these natural explanations break down because it isn't just the Nile. It's all the streams. It's even ponds. It's even pools of water. It's even the water that is in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. So this is not just the Nile, but it's significant that it is the Nile because that was one of the gods that they worshipped. So um, they have this situation. And, and the thing that's kind of, as a side note, 
the Egyptians were clean freaks, okay? They were the original Mr. Clean. Remember, they didn't want anything to do with shepherds. So, hey, when you come in, just tell them, you know, your shepherds are going to say, well, keep them far away, and you guys stay in the land of Goshen. Because they didn't want to be around these, these dirty guys. So they were clean freaks. And so now he's going down to the Nile to, to wash, and now this thing is becoming blood red. And so they're not going to be able to wash. They're not going to be able to clean. And then it gets worse. In verse, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 14, you get the second plague of a frog invasion. I mean... All over the place. Let's just, just read this. The Lord spoke to Moses. Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up into your house and into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come up on you, on your people, and all your servants. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. And so this is exactly what takes place. It's just the whole land. And so... You can see that um, in verse 7, Janus and Jambres, the magicians, in, um, with their enchantment, so they said, hey, we can do frogs. <laughs> frogs? Yeah, we can do frogs. It's like, we don't want frogs. We want frogs to go away. But they, again, it discredits. But they deal with this. I mean, I, it, you, you know, you're thinking, no, frogs. Why frogs? Because they worshipped. One of their gods, um, whose name was Hecate, a goddess, and had the form of a, 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 a woman, but the head of a frog. And if you look this up, you're going to immediately think, Jar Jar Binks. That's, I'm telling you, I was like, I wonder if they looked at this goddess, you know, when they made the character Jar Jar Binks. But um, that's, what, that's what she looked like. And, um, you know, so again, this was one that they worshipped. But here's the thing. They believe that this was where life came from. And guess what they were not allowed to do according to the religion to a frog? They weren't allowed to kill it. So they have all of these frogs. Their goddess is overwhelming them. And they can't do anything. Um, and they're all over the place. You can't get away from them. So, again, a direct attack. It certainly is meant to break them down. Um, and to get them to the place where they say, go. But it also is a direct attack against their God that they worshipped, the goddess that they worshipped. So um, <laughs> um, Pharaoh calls for Moses in verse 8. He says, ask the Lord that these frogs will go, um, and then, uh, then I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Of course, this happens, and then he immediately changes his mind and doesn't let them go. So we move into verses 15 through 19 where we come to the third plague. And we don't know exactly what the insect was. I'm going to read from the New King James and it's translated lice. Some translations may be gnats. Some have said mosquitoes. Others have said maybe it's that sacred, you know, uh, dung beetle that was so uh, common in the land of Egypt and, um, you know, on many of their artifacts and stuff. So we don't know. But it was an insect that was, you know, just, again, overwhelmed them. So let's read verse 15. Pharaoh saw that there was relief. He hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on man and beast. Whatever this insect was, it was all over the place. Now, the magicians come, and um, they're like, wow, this, is, this one's impressive. We can do serpents, you know, staffs into serpents. We can do that. We can turn water into blood. We can even do the frog thing, but we can't do this one. And the response is, in verse 19, it says, this is the finger of God. 
But even then, Pharaoh's heart still grows hard and is unwilling. So they're having all of these plagues come upon them, but his heart is not getting softer. It is just meant to be a judgment against their gods, against them who have oppressed and murdered um, the Israelites and to be the thing that would eventually let them go. So verse 20 through verse 32, uh, we have the fourth plague. And in this fourth plague, which is a, a plague of flies, there's also going to be an offer of compromise in their desire to worship. So let's begin reading there. And the Lord said to Moses, rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes to the water. So you can imagine Pharaoh's like, you again? You know, so it's like, there he is. He's coming out and Moses and Aaron right there to greet him. And he says, you got to let the people go that they may serve. This is what the Lord wants. Verse 21, or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and on your servants on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also on the ground on which they stand. That would be really gross, wouldn't it? This every step you take, you're squishing flies. And um, we don't know, again, exactly what this was, but the Septuagint version of uh, this is a Greek uh, writing of the Old Testament um, was known as a dog fly, which was a biting insect. So they're all, I mean, not only do you have the annoyance of just a fly buzzing around and the, that it's dirty, but now it's also biting you. And it's everywhere, swarms of them. You know, I lived in Australia and, um, for a couple of years. And the one thing that they don't tell you about is how bad the flies are there. They are so bad. You ever seen those goofy little hats that they have with all the corks hanging down off of it? You ever seen those hats? There's a reason why they wear them. Because, you know, they're move, they just move and it just it moves all those, those flies away. And they had these terrible flies, not swarms of them, but they were called blow flies. And when you would, when you go to kill them, a maggot would come out. They were so disgusting. And that, when I think about this, I think of my whole entire house being full of these things and stepping on it. But these things then biting you too. Um, and, and that's what they have. They have swarms of flies all over the land. Actually, it says in the end of verse 24, uh, the land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. It was so bad that it just the whole land was defiled. So... The first compromise we read of by Pharaoh is in verse 25. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God in the land. Not three days' journey into the wilderness. Just stay here and offer up your sacrifice. But Moses says, Yeah, we can't do that. Uh, if we start sacrificing livestock, you guys worship them, and then we're going to be stoned to death, he says at the end of verse 26. We must go a three days' journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to our Lord as he commanded us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. So first it's, you got to stay here. He says, no, we've got to go. Okay, you can go, but don't be an extremist. Don't go too far with this worship thing. Stay close. Two compromises. We'll see more compromises come as we move through. But this is always the way of the enemy. He's always trying to get the people of God to only go so far in their worship and in their sacrifice and their service. Don't be all in. Don't be, you know, a fanatic. Well, you know what a fanatic is, don't you? Somebody who loves Jesus more than you. That's what a fanatic is. And, and so... This is the, just stay here. But the Lord has called us to come out, right? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, 
Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The Lord wants us to come out, not remain inside. And this is exactly what Pharaoh is saying. It's just, don't go too far. Don't be totally separated from us. And this is the challenge that in the battle that all of us will fight until the day we are in the presence of the Lord is that there will constantly be offers of compromise that are offered up to us, maybe by our own mind, maybe by people we know, maybe by the world around us. Well, you can do this, but you can't do that. You can, only, you can worship like this, but you can't worship like that. And, you know, we, we don't look to the world. We don't look to our government to tell us how and when we can worship. We worship the Lord because we've been commanded to, right? But then there's those other areas of our life that go beyond just coming out and worshiping, but it's, it's how you live your life. And it's like, well, you know, I follow the Lord. I believe Jesus is, is, you know, the Savior of the world. But I don't want to leave these things behind. I don't want to make a sacrifice of this kind of uh, behavior, this kind of engagement in my life. I, I really like these things, so I'm not going to give them up to follow the Lord. But can you do that and call yourself a Christian? Jesus told us that if we want to follow him, that we must leave behind even our mother or father, brother and sister, and that if we are unwilling to do that, he said, you are not worthy to follow me. If you're not willing to give up all and follow me, then you're not worthy to follow me. It's like Jesus saying, what do you think, I'm a chump or something? Are you just, I become a nobody? And you can just make all kinds of compromises. You can take my word and, and not take it seriously. And then, you know, I'm such a desperate, you know, person that I'll take whoever's willing to come on any terms at all. He says, that's not so. If you're going to follow me, you're going to take up your cross. You're going to deny yourself. Another place he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I ask you to do? You must be obedient. You must follow me. There is such a thought in our world today um, among so many believers, or at least professing believers, that you can not follow the Lord and he doesn't care. And that's all right. But you don't find that anywhere in the Bible. You, don't, you can't find even a single verse that would give the indication that says go live however you want to. And God's going to be okay with it. He's not okay with it. He's told us how to live. And the call to us is to come out. The call to the, uh, to the Israelites was to come out from Egypt, get way out from Egypt, and come and worship me. And the same is true for us. The Lord calls us to come out. And these little areas of our life that we try to hold on to and keep and think, well, God doesn't care. It's just, that's not true. So maybe somebody's told you that, or maybe you're trying to think that the Lord calls us to repentance. The Lord calls us to live a holy life. So in the midst of you know, all of this, these flies, these potentially biting flies that have defiled the land, um, he's willing to let them go, but he wants them to make a compromise and don't go out of the land or don't go very far. Be aware of those compromises um, that would be offered up to you. As we move into chapter 9, we're going to get the plagues number 5, 6, and 7, and that's as far as we'll take it. But at chapter 9, verse 1 uh, through 7, we get the fifth plague, and this is a disease that's going to come upon the cattle. Um, again, they had a god that they worshipped, the god of the flies. <laughs> um, they also have, of course, as one of their main gods, the, the, the cattle god. Um, remember when they are in the, the old children of Israel are in the wilderness, and what do they make to worship? A golden calf. Where did they get the idea to worship a calf from? From Egypt. That's what one of the gods that they worship. So the Lord again still making war against uh, Egypt and her gods. We read. Uh, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses, on donkeys, on the camels, on oxen, in the sheep. A very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. So they're in the land of Goshen. And while all these terrible plagues are falling upon the Egyptians, there in the land of Goshen, 
they are experiencing reprieve. Why? Because God's people are not appointed to wrath. God's people are not appointed to wrath. Think of the conversation that Abraham had with the Lord back in the book of Genesis. When he learned that he was going to destroy Sodom, he said, Lord, would you destroy if there were 50 righteous? And then he gets all the way down to 10. Remember? And the Lord says, I wouldn't destroy if there's 10. The angels of the Lord went on from there into Sodom, and they were about to destroy, but they could not destroy Sodom until what? Until they got Lot and his family out. Now, once they were out, then they could rain down the judgment upon this city. Why? Because God will not destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. And so he is able to go. Now, here in this situation, you see the same thing God is preserving. Again, so many similarities. You think of the 144,000 um, that are going to be preserved of the Jews during the Great Tribulation. Or you think about those that will flee into the wilderness that will receive uh, safety in the wilderness. Um, just as there's going to be an evil man like Pharaoh in the personage of, of, of the Antichrist and how there's going to be trying to wipe them out as they were trying to wipe them out. There's so many, again, so many similarities in the judgments that come upon him. We have ten plagues here, but then you have the different series of uh, the judgments of the trumpets and the bulls that are going to come upon the, the land, you know, in those seven years. So the disease comes, and there is no trouble that comes to the Israelites' uh, livestock. In verse 8, um, we begin reading down to verse 12. And this is the sixth plague, and this time boils are going to break out all over their body. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from a furnace, and let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. So what is the furnace? We don't know. But I think it is an interesting thing to consider. If these were the furnaces that were used to make the bricks, and they're taking the ashes from the oppression and they're throwing it up in the air, and this is going to come back upon the Egyptians. And what we read in verse 9 is it causes boils that break out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Then they took the ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses scattered them toward heaven, and they caused boils that break out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. So they don't even show up to the party this time. They're like, no, we're staying in bed. And um, for the boils were on the magicians and uh, all the Egyptians, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. So sometimes we read of Pharaoh hardening his heart. And then here we read of God hardening his heart. And he did not heed them just as the Lord had spoke to Moses. So <clears throat> there was, um, they had gods that they worshipped to prevent disease and so forth. Um, and you know, Sekhmet and Sunu were two of these gods that they worshipped. And again, these gods could do nothing to stop the pronouncement. Um, as a matter of fact, those were, who were his representatives succumbed to these things so much so that they couldn't even begin to do anything to stop. Now the seventh plague, and this is where we're going to end today, verses 13 through 35, is a plague of just a, a massive thunderstorm. Lightning that's hitting the ground, catching things on fire, super heavy hailstones that are just it's destroying anything that's in the field. It's, um, the crops are going to be destroyed because of this. Trees are going to be shattered. It's going to look like bombs had gone off in the land. And so we read at verse 13, The Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart, and on your servants and on your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. These are meant to convince him that he alone is God. Verse 15, Now if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. He's saying, if I wanted to have just dealt with you in one single blow, I could have done it. But I'm not doing that with you. What I'm doing with you is I'm doing one successive judgment after another so that everybody will know that I am God. 
And I have power to do what I want to do. And that even in your hardness of heart and in your rebellion, I'm going to use that because that just gives me one more plague to bring down upon the land that people will know who I am, that I would be acknowledged. And he says, I could have dealt with you in one single blow, but I'm doing it this way, that my, my, na- my name may be declared in all the earth. This is part of the purpose of the ten plagues. And verse 17, as yet you exalt yourself against my people in that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause very heavy hail to rain down, such as not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field. For the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home and they shall die. Now, what you read here is a lot of the Egyptians said, um, I think I'm going to believe them this time. And they brought their animals into their homes and so forth. And the storm came. So you have, in verse 24, so the hail, uh, so there was hail and fire mingled with the hail. So you have this massive thunderstorm. You have these, however big they are, these massive talent, you know, these uh, uh, hell that's coming down, and it's just blowing things up, it's destroying everything, and you have lightning that just will not stop striking the ground, setting fire everywhere. I mean, how terrifying it would have been. Um, you know, I've, I've been in hell storms, we probably all have, where they're just like little pebble size, um, but my dad was actually driving from California to Colorado, and they were in a, um, a, a truck, like a, like a Hertz Pinsky truck. And they ran into a, a storm and they were like um, the size of softballs. And he said, it was awesome. And, um, and my brother-in-law actually was riding with them and he was down on the floorboard. True story. I'm sure he'll appreciate me telling the story. He was down on the floorboard of the truck, according to my dad, and praying to Jesus to spare their lives. And he said that everything was, the, the, the car they were towing behind him was totaled out. And, and just imagine if the Lord decides to send, you know, those that are 100 pounds or something like that to this earth, what it would do, the amount of speed these things would have coming. And then there's the fire that's taking place. And it was an awesome sight. But the children of Israel, they didn't have to deal with it at all. So pick up and close at verse 34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, because he said, please, you know, ask, he sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard, neither would he let the children of Israel go, um, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. So he sins here, and actually, he even confesses that he had sinned um, earlier. In verse 27, which we didn't read, it says, The Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and said to them, I have sinned this time. So it isn't like the Lord is just pulling strings on this guy like a puppet. He's making conscious decisions to sin, and he knows that he is sinning in these things. And so he walks down that path, and the Lord just hardens his heart. He goes further in it, and he hardens his heart. Which is really a, a, a terrifying thought, to think that you could... If God was to harden your heart, or let's see, now you even use the word harden. But if God today was to make firm wherever your heart is to the Lord, would you be happy with it? I mean, it doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any worse than where it is right now today. If the Lord is just, just to lock it into place, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing for you? And so I think we should, we should think about this. And, and, of course, Pharaoh was a, an individual, but it is a terrifying thing to think that I could be walking in compromise and say, fine, compromise it'll be. Or a hard heart, I don't believe in God. I don't want anything to do. Fine, you will never believe in me. And so we know that God's spirit will not always strive. So, so God is showing his power. He's wanting everybody to know through these plagues that he is the one true almighty God. No wonder they fight so hard to say that the book of Exodus and this whole you know, account that we have is just made up fairy tales. Because if you've got to deal with this as being real, then you have to deal with a God who judges. 
And man doesn't want to do that. Actually, Peter talks about this, that how in the last days that they will deny that God judged and that the world is, con continues as it always had. And he says, this they willfully forget, the flood. They will willfully forget the flood. Why does our world fight so hard against this idea that there was a, a worldwide flood? Because it speaks of what? The judgment of God. Why do they fight so much about this Exodus account? Because it speaks of the judgment of God. And so man pushes that aside so they don't have to deal with the idea of being accountable to the Lord. But guess what? We are accountable to the Lord. And you can come to the Lord through Jesus Christ and he will bear the penalty for your sins. Or you can come to the Lord on your own and you will bear the penalty for your sins. But the Lord does not want you to have to endure um, an eternity in hell separated from him in the lake of fire. So he sent his son so you won't have to go through that judgment. This is why he is still waiting. This is why he has not returned because he's waiting for more people to repent and come to him that they would escape the judgment. So if you've never come to Christ, if you've never come to the Lord, I pray that you would come today. And if you're making that compromise and you're just, as a Christian, you're just playing a game and you're thinking you can get away with it and you can live however you want to and you can write your own rules, I pray that you see that there's no place for compromise. We come and we worship the Lord three days out in the wilderness, just as he said. And we don't have permission to, re to rewrite it and say, well, it's going to be this way. No, the Lord has told us how to worship him. And I pray that you will do that and you'll know the fullness. You know, the children of Israel... If they never left Egypt, they would have never made it to the promised land. And some of you, it's fam where you are right now, it's familiar, and you're used to it, and at least you know it. But you know what? There is something so glorious and wonderful that God has planned for you. Not only in this life of abundance, but in the next life. He's gone to prepare a place for you. And I pray that you will come to him and you will receive him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you hear our cry. That when we are in need, when we are in that place, you listen to the cry and you come and you do deliver. And Lord, you saw our state as those who had sinned and you, Lord, came and you sent your son to die on the cross to rescue us, to deliver us. Except it's your son that, that endured the plague. It's your son that endured the judgment rather than us. We thank you for that kindness, Lord. I mean, thank you seems like a word that's far too little and doesn't quite get the job done. But thank you that you have redeemed us. Thank you that you're willing to let your son take the, the plague of sin upon his body, that we might be set free. If you're here today and you need to come to Christ, then we ask that you just make that decision right where you are. Right where you are, you can just say, Lord, I want to be forgiven. I want to be right with you. I don't want to experience your judgment. I want to be right with you. And I want to go and I want to worship you. I want to follow you. That's all you got to say to him. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, that he rose from the dead three days later, and confess that he's your Lord. That's all he's looking for. That's all he's looking for. And if you're one that has made that confession, praise the Lord. How are you doing on that compromise department? Are you making compromises? trying to write your own Christian dogma. You don't have right to do it. You don't have place to do it. The Lord says, follow me. Obey me. And here's the great thing. Everything that God asks us to do is the right and best thing to do. Trust him. Believe him.